I just graduated from UC Berkeley's MFA art practice program and I wanted to make this video for you all since I've gotten so many questions about my time in the program, about the process applying. I get a lot of questions about that. So I thought I'd make this video just to share with all of you and also because I'm someone that really values um, passing on information that can be supportive. It's just funny that when you finish something, the first thing a lot of people ask you is, what are you doing now? <laughs> and I'm like, I need a fucking moment to rest. <laughs> I need a moment to think about what just happened. <laughs> yeah, give yourself space in between big accomplishments and between projects, if you can, because some of us can't, because yeah, I'm definitely resting, but I'm also working because there's still stuff to do. I've also put chapters in this video in case you want to jump around, as there are different parts of this story that I share of my own personal story, but also do share some vital information about the whole process in general. Stay tuned because at the end of this video I'm going to be sharing a couple of tips that I feel like might help you with your application process both for the MFA program and just in general with life. I'm sharing my own personal experience and I hope that it can be informative and I definitely want to encourage you to do your own research and feel free to leave me comments with any questions or any reflections that you might have. I would love to just Keep the conversation going because I see this again as the beginning of a conversation with all of you here on YouTube. Yeah, so where do I begin? <laughs> I'm actually here at the Richmond Field Station. This is where graduate students at UC Berkeley in the MFA Art Practice Program, this is where we have graduate studios. And so if you get into this program, you would be in this space and it's actually a really tranquil space. I'm here on a Sunday and it's pretty quiet. There are definitely people here doing research and working on stuff, but for the most part, it's pretty quiet. It's um, There's a lot of nature here. It used to be an industrial area and and there are definitely a lot of remnants of that. There are a lot of people tracking the toxicity of the area. And you do get that feeling that you're um, kind of seeing the nature in a way, like reclaiming some of the industrial, but also feeling a lot of that grief too <laughs> in this space, seeing what's been done to the nature here and also how resilient the plant and animal life is here. Let me know if you would like for me to make a video to show you what my studio looks like. Leave me a comment below because I definitely would love to make a video to show you what my actual studio it looks like I have a couple of months left in the studio. I am going to be doing an artist residency and next month in Los Angeles at Coaxial. I'm going to be linking a link to an event. If you're in the LA area, I would love to see you. It would be so amazing to connect. But yeah, but when I get back from my residency in LA, I would love to make a video in my studio to show you what it looks like if you're interested. I want to share a little bit about myself. So um, I have a master's in counseling that I got in 2013 in Portland, Oregon. And when I applied for the master's in counseling, I also applied for a MFA at Portland State University in the social practice program. And I ended up getting into the counseling program, but I did not get in to the MFA program. And I think that's one thing that I just really want to say to begin with, with this video is that it's not easy to get into an MFA program. It definitely takes a lot of work. A lot of folks, including myself, have to apply year after year. And a lot of things need to line up in order for it to be the right moment for you to be in an MFA program. So I definitely want to say that I can really empathize with people who have had to apply a few times, you know, have felt that like defeat of not getting an interview. I've been there. So I just want to say that to begin with too, because I just know how hard it can be to have a dream, to see yourself moving in a certain direction in your life and to have that just not happen and to maybe have to do it a few times and to kind of have to keep rebuilding that confidence and that trust and taking those risks, I know how hard that is. 
And so, you know, after I got rejected from the MFA program at Portland State, I did finish the counseling program. It was an incredible program. I did an emphasis on somatic psychotherapy and I learned so much about myself. And during that time, I was also helping to organize an arts festival in Portland, Oregon. So after working as a therapist for a few years, I ended up um, moving to Los Angeles. I was living in LA and working in a treatment program. I got a really incredible reading from an amazing psychic who gave me so much good advice. I highly recommend people working with them. Actually, I'm going to be linking a link to their website here in the description of this video because I really recommend them as a reader because they give me some really good advice and uh, they told me to really work part-time and to treat my practice as a really big part of my career, of my work, and to really take it seriously and to really make space for it. And I started making space for it. I started working in LA in different art institutions. I started showing my work and I ended up getting my license in 2018, my marriage and family therapist license. And a couple of weeks after I got my LMFT, I ended up getting awarded the Tulsa Artist Fellowship in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I ended up making the really big decision to move full time into my art practice. One of the reasons I want to share my story is because I think there's no one path towards getting into an MFA program or towards stepping into another role in your life. I really do feel like some of us traverse non-linear paths and non-traditional paths. And I really want to normalize that. And so I I also want to just say that that's also something that could happen in your life. You might have a passion for something. You might be really interested in a certain practice or field. You might excel in it. You might work in it for a while. You might move into art practice. You might move into working in construction, in the healing arts. You might become a tarot reader. You might become an athlete. There's so many ways that we can really explore other parts of ourselves. I'm definitely someone that believes that we are complex people and that we have a lot of ways that we show up in the world <laughs> and I love that about people and I love that about myself that I'm not just one type of person. So while I was in Tulsa after my first year of being in residency I had a moment where I was like I could really use some support and thinking about my practice and talking about it and getting reflections about it. The Tulsa Artist Fellowship was supportive to me financially and they really helped me have the time and space to be able to work on my practice. And though there wasn't much critique, there wasn't much conversation around our practices. A lot of the artists, you know, we were all independent workers. We all had our practices and a lot of us had to be away. And so I really was wanting a container to be able to really focus on my practice and really um, think about it because you know it's important work that we're doing we can all benefit from having a space where we can talk about our practices and really um, nuanced ways to get other people's reflections and opinions about your practice to see how your work is impacting others is so important and uh, that's something that I really feel like I was able to do within the program but I'm kind of getting a little bit ahead of myself so <laughs> while I was in Tulsa I really felt like I needed that so that was one of the reasons I applied to graduate school. I finally felt like I was ready for an MFA program. And you know, another thing I want to add to what I was saying earlier is that since I got my master's in counseling at Portland State University between that time and 2019, when I applied for UC Berkeley again, I applied maybe around five or six times to different graduate MFA programs and got rejected a bunch of times, didn't get any interviews. And so, yeah, so by 2019, you know, I really felt like I was ready. I had had a solo show already. I was preparing for my second one and I was in an artist fellowship. I was working full time as an artist and I really felt like I was at a place where I could really benefit, as I was saying, from an MFA program. But I felt ready. I felt really ready. And so I knew I was going to get one interview at least, you know, and so I had an interview at UC Berkeley and one at USC and I ended up getting into both programs, which really surprised me, and I was really grateful for that. And I ended up picking UC Berkeley because of a different couple of reasons, um, one of them being that UC Berkeley was really able to offer a lot more support. I was able to be a graduate student instructor. Basically, almost every single semester, even during the summer, I taught a class in digital photography, and I ended up taking one semester off myself because I wanted a little bit more time to focus on my studio work. That was something that was really 
really appealing for me. Those of you who know me know that I love to teach, that I love to be an educator. And so I really wanted to go to a school where I could teach and UC Berkeley was able to really offer that. So that's something that if you're looking for that, I think that was something that was really incredible and made my experience at UC Berkeley really remarkable was that I was able to teach different kinds of classes. And through those classes, I met some really incredible people. So in a couple of the classes that I helped be a graduate student instructor for, they were classes where we invited artists to come speak to our class and we invited the most amazing people and I got to meet so many amazing curators and artists from all over the world, people that I never thought I would meet so quickly in my life. That was what helped me decide to go to UC Berkeley was the, their support and the uh, teaching experience that I would get and I'm hoping to continue teaching art practice at some point. And I just want to say that I love USC and I love their MFA program. I've been really inspired by so much art that I've seen come out of that program. There's some amazing people that I love so much who've graduated with an MFA from the U USC uh, program. And I was fortunate enough when I was living in Los Angeles to be able to go visit and see a lot of those artists. And that was one of the reasons I was so excited about that school, just because I had seen the kind of work that was coming out of there and really resonated with a lot of it. And so it was a hard decision to decide to go to UC Berkeley. But really, again, as I said, what helped me decide was really my goals in life. I wanted to teach more. USC did offer some teaching experience, but not as much as UC Berkeley. And as you know, UC Berkeley's program is fully funded. We do get a small stipend in the program. We don't pay anything for tuition, and that's definitely a strong suit in the program. And of course, the faculty at UC Berkeley are incredible. I had the most amazing relationships grow within the program, both with, with the faculty and as well as with students. I was just in awe of the people who were brought into the program. And so I feel like my experience is going to be different than what yours might be. I started my program remotely. I was actually still living in Oklahoma when I started the uh, program at UC Berkeley and I was remote for about a year and it did have its drawbacks. Um, of course, you know, I wasn't able to be on campus. I wasn't able to see people in person. One thing that I really missed during COVID was that, you know, things were really formal over Zoom. It's a really structured way of working with each other. And there weren't those moments for just, um, conversation, you know, just about whatever, about the day, about the weather, you know, just things that bring you socially, relationally closer to people um, and also get to help you know people in a different way. Like there wasn't really much of that because you can't really do that on Zoom or you can try, but it's a little awkward sometimes. <laughs> so yeah, so my experience at UC Berkeley was, is going to be different than a lot of people's. Um, one year of it was fully remote. The second year was hybrid, mostly in person, thankfully. And so I wasn't really able to use the facilities as much and I did end up in the first year moving to California moving to the Bay Area and so I was able to for half of the first year I was able to use some of the facilities a little bit and I had a studio on campus because at this time people weren't really going to campus very much we had our our studios on campus and I think I have a couple of videos that I'll link here in the description where I show you what my studio looked like um, during my first year in the MFA program at UC Berkeley and so I think that's something I struggled with a little bit as an artist was that I actually wanted to really have a lot of hands-on learning in the MFA program. I wanted to work on sculpture, on installation. These are things that I've done a little bit in my practice, but I just wanted to move more into it. And so thankfully in the second year, I did get a lot of that support. I worked with some amazing um, professors that really helped me think about sculpture and materiality. I was also blessed enough to be able to have some incredible studio visits where I got to talk about materials and about my process and about art making with these working artists and just got so many incredible ideas that really helped me to, you know, I would say that even though it was remote for, you know, a big part of the program, I still got a lot out of it. I still learned a lot about material, maybe not as much as I would have had it not been remote for a part of the year. But I feel like I'm at a good place when it comes to materiality now with sculpture. I really feel like I have a practice that I'm excited about. And so it really helped me move in a direction that is 
is new for me as an artist and one that I'm excited about and that I'm really leaning into and I'm like going to be working on projects coming up that are really related to sculpture and to um, printmaking, things that I really worked on. And I think another thing that was really incredible was that because we were remote, I also started to deepen into my digital practice and to really see it as a practice, to really see it as a tradition, as something that has technique and skill and takes time and has also material too, material that you work with. And so I really got to have an even deeper appreciation for the digital realm and um, also got to see how I'm an artist who works both with the digital and the physical and that's a big part of my practice and um, and I think in a way part of it is also the relational which is why I'm here on YouTube making a video about my experience as well because I am someone that loves to connect with people and people are a big part of my practice too. A lot of the installations I create are spaces for people that I want uh, them to inhabit or not inhabit or feel something in or not feel something in. So overall I'm really really grateful and really happy with my my experience at UC Berkeley. I met some incredible artists. I got to work with some amazing advisors. I got to work on projects that were really fun, that were really meaningful, that helped me grow and expand. I got some new language about my practice. I got to really understand some ways that I like to work and don't like to work. I got to feel held and supported by a group of people and really understood as an artist too. And I also got to see where my art rubs people the wrong way, where it makes them confused or angry. I got to see how my art might be doing things that I don't really even understand yet. <laughs> so the overall structure of the program is that your first year you take, uh, well actually for both years you take critique and that's like the main class where we talk about our practices, what we're working on, what our research is, what we're thinking about. We share it together as a group and um, there's a professor that facilitates. The other classes that you take are around theory and then you get to decide what the other classes are. I also got a graduate certificate in new media so I took classes in new media. I got to work um, with an incredible advisor who is the director of the Berkeley Center for New Media. Her name is Abigail DeKosnick. She's so amazing. I'm linking you to her website so you can read some more about her too. She's someone that I'm really grateful that I met at UC Berkeley. And so I did take classes that were theory based, that were research based, that were writing based. Um, that classes I felt really helped me understand my practice in different ways, helped me get some new language and words and learn about history, learn about traditions. And I also took a lot of studio art classes. And for me, that felt really important. I wanted to have space to practice and to really work. I took an amazing class called Electrocrafting. I think it was my first semester at UC Berkeley. And it was a class where we really thought about technologies in different ways. And the Electrocrafting class was with Professor um, Chris Kubik. I really loved the way he taught and it was all remote again and he found a really good way to work with us and was really supportive and understood that a lot of the artists who were in the class were not science majors or computer science majors. <laughs> we learned coding and we did things with GIFs. We did things with video games. Like there was so much in the class that was really exciting and also challenging too for me as someone who traditionally doesn't think a lot about computers in that way. And I took an installation art class with an amazing professor too that really helped me a lot. Um, her name is Carrie Holt and that installation art class, it was done remotely and this professor found really incredible ways to really bring in materiality. Yeah, and to also have us work hands on and also, you know, and to be able to share it virtually. I also took sculpture classes with Brody Ryman who also ended up becoming one of my advisors. I loved working with Brody. Brody was an incredible teacher. I feel like so many people love Brody because she's just so um, warm and nurturing and accepting and open and also really insightful and reflective and really helped me a lot to think about materiality and what sculpture means in my practice and ways that I work. And so I feel like I've kind of felt a little bit maybe of a hierarchy at UC Berkeley. It's not spoken of very openly, but it's there where studio classes are maybe not seen as rigorous, quote unquote, as theory classes or classes about history or of a you know difficult subject. To me, what I was looking for, I was really wanting studio classes 
places. And so I was really grateful to have that, especially as I shared earlier that I didn't have a lot of hands-on experience. You know, as people who maybe know me, I am not someone who likes hierarchies of value around knowledge or information or practice. And so I definitely did what felt right for me. And I'm so glad I did. I feel like it really helped my practice grow. And I'm really proud of the work that I did for the MFA thesis show that is currently up right now. If you're in the Bay Area, it's at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. It's up until the end of July this year. And so definitely recommend you go see it. I have shared some photos on my website as well. If you're interested in looking at that, I'm going to be linking that here in this video just to share the culmination of some of my research that I've been doing. I'm hoping you could see it in the work. Um, I'm hoping you could see how I learned and grew in the program. Uh, you could definitely see that, you know, track, you could track it in my website in a sense. You could see how I've grown as an artist, the different ways I've explored, different practices and materials and where I'm at now. And as I said, I have some exciting projects that I'm going to be working on in the next few months. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how these practices continue to grow and evolve. And um, as I was sharing earlier, I'm also a digital artist and I've been minting some of my work on the blockchain and I've been selling some of my work as digital editions. I've also been thinking of now potentially creating some other types of editions of work uh, like fabric editions or even photo prints. If you're interested in anything like that, let me know because I've definitely gotten some folks reaching out to me about that. It's something I've been thinking about, uh, just the notion of editions, what that means uh, for artists because I know a lot of artists work within editions and it's not something I've done very much until I started working on the blockchain and have started releasing editions of work online. And so I'm going to link my link tree. It's going to be the first link here in the description of this video. It connects you to everything, including my website. And also it connects you to where I am editioning my artwork. So if you're interested in looking at it, potentially collecting it, it is there for you to see. I'm going to be minting some exciting new projects soon. So just letting you know here. <laughs> a couple more things about my experience at UC Berkeley. The um, department has a lot of support for different kinds of practices. One thing I loved about the program was that it was incredibly interdisciplinary. No artists really worked in one medium. And so we really um, got to learn about many different kinds of mediums. We got to see many different kinds of art practices. And the the department is set up in that way in a sense there are uh, there's places for digital work to be done for video making for photo printing for printmaking for sculpture work um, and also one thing that's really incredible about uc berkeley is that it is connected also to so many other incredible departments of research and history and you also get to connect with them too and i think that's something that for me was a little bit intense at the beginning in the program was that there was so much that I wanted to learn about. There were so many people I wanted to work with. There were so many classes I wanted to take. And I definitely like overwhelmed myself in the first year, I feel, with the amount of classes and um, activities that I tried to do. Even if it was during the pandemic, there was still a lot going on on Zoom. <laughs> so you do get a really in-depth research-based education. You have access to some of the most incredible archives, to the world's like research to cutting edge research that's happening at UC Berkeley in, again, as I said, within a lot of different departments. And so that's something that's really incredible. And that's something that's really amazing to be associated with and to also have your practice grow alongside of. I think that's something that I really noticed is that I deepened into elements of my practice that I knew were there, but maybe didn't have language for. And I also got to discover other parts of my work and other ways that I work that have felt really exciting and I got to learn kind of terms, ideas, concepts, practices that really are going to continue to sustain my practice and help it grow and expand. And I think one thing that was really incredible was that I did get a lot of support around some of the ways that as an artist I've been wounded or hurt, some of the ways that I've um, maybe been taught to not show up, you know, and I've really gotten to question a lot of the noise or the voices in my head that say things around my practice. And I've also really, I feel like learned some of their medicine. I've learned some of their 
um, purposes in my practice and things that they've been pointing me towards and maybe other ways to think about them that I think is really going to help me write about my work and also be able to share about it when I'm, you know, talking with the curators, artists, and people about my practice. I really feel like I built some connections and relationships during my time at UC Berkeley that are going to be lifelong with faculty, with students, and that's a huge, huge, huge blessing of the program. I am so grateful for my connections, for the people that I got to meet during my time at UC Berkeley. Again, as I said earlier, my advisor was Stephanie Sahuko, and she's actually someone that I've been so excited about as an artist since I was really young. I think I reached out to Stephanie when I was maybe in my early 20s and she had just graduated herself. And so it felt really serendipitous, really beautiful that we got to work together, that she was my advisor. She helped me so much, so much. She's such a generous person. She's someone who does so much in her practice. She's so supportive of artists and she's also so thoughtful as a person. And a lot of her practices um, and the things that she researches and thinks about are things that I really care about. And so I got to have a lot of really incredible one-on-one -on -one conversations with her that have really helped me grow as a person and as an artist. And I'm also so grateful for the other faculty of the program. I had some incredible classes with them and conversations with them. And again, I feel like with all the faculty in the program, these are going to be lifelong relationships. I cannot wait to reconnect with folks. And the same can be said of the students in the program. I met some incredible people and uh, you can actually go on the UC Berkeley website and look at who was in the program with me. Um, I think they're gonna keep our info up maybe for a little bit longer, but uh, there's a new class coming in. <laughs> but I'll link them there if you're interested so you can see who they are. But again, I really felt like I built some amazing relationships with folks. And I think that's one of the most beautiful parts of, um, that's one of the most beautiful things that comes out of a graduate program is these lifelong relationships. I feel the same way about my graduate program at Portland State University. I actually just saw some friends from that program recently and these are connections that are lifelong and that are going to be supportive and help you forever and that's invaluable, you know. So overall a lot of gratitude. <laughs> just feeling a lot of gratitude. A lot of gratitude for where I'm at right now and uh, just grateful that my life path has looked like this and grateful for emergence, <laughs> grateful for things appearing and for um, trust that things will show up. And so in the same way, I'm trusting now about where I'm headed. I know that there are so many good things coming up and I am so excited by my channel here. I'm almost at a thousand subscribers. I'm just so excited by about the journey that I'm on right now. And I'm so excited that y'all are a part of it, that you're here with me. Thank you so much for being so kind and for sharing so much love in the comments. And I really appreciate you all. I know it takes me some time to get back to you sometimes but I try to <laughs> I definitely try to. Um, I'm, a, I'm on all the social media platforms, so um, I need an assistant, I think. <laughs> I think I need an assistant at this point because it's just so much to keep up with. So, manifesting abundance and support for an assistant and maybe a business manager and maybe an agent and who knows what else. So, be it or better. One amazing tip that I really want to share, and this is kind of a little bonus for those of you who've made it all the way to the end of this video. I just want to share that there is a certain process that they use at UC Berkeley, and I think it's maybe done in other universities, and I never knew about this, and it's kind of like maybe withheld information or information that some people share, but I think it's important to share information that could really help people like put a step forward in their work and also potentially have a little bit better of a chance of getting into some of these programs there's a certain process that they use to review the portfolios during the MFA program and that process is that they look at everyone's first image the first image in the portfolio and they end up getting rid of about half the people that apply maybe after just that one image then I think they move on to the second image and they I think maybe you know cut about half the people as well and then I think they move into the third image if you've made it through that round to the third 
third round. You then kind of get your portfolio looked at and they start to um, really go more in depth. And that doesn't mean that they don't look into everyone's application. I'm sure they do, but these are the people that they really focus on. People that have made it all the way through this you know, process. And so with that, you know, as you're working on your portfolio, make sure your top three images are really, really strong and that you feel like they really represent your practice in a way that you feel proud of. Make sure they're not of the same thing. And if they are going to be of the same thing, make sure that it's like really impactful. But I would really recommend having three different projects um, and each of them being eye-catching, your top three images. And also if you have had work that's public or if you've had solo shows or exhibitions, really highlight that, of course, as well. Um, I think, you know, the bigger the work is, the more of an impact it's had culturally, that's going to get really get people's attention, right? So also as an artist, so I would recommend you like looking, creating, conjuring, finding moments like that, building those networks and thinking of how your art could show up in public spaces. And of course, by that, I mean everything from billboards to exhibitions to installations, interventions. It could be so many different kinds of work. And I don't necessarily feel like they have to be institutionalized either. They, I'm very much a DIY person. I come from the DIY space. I understand the value and the need for DIY and underground spaces and how much they um, actually contribute to contemporary art practice and visual arts and are a big part of the web that um, is really important within the art field. Okay, so one of the last tips that I want to share is that you should always give yourself options. You should always apply for more than what you think you need. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is a big part of success is failure. And part of that requires us having the capacity to keep failing over and over, knowing that at some point we will also receive success. And because of that, I've always been someone who applies for many things at once. So don't just apply for one graduate program, apply for two or three, let yourself have a little bit of flexibility in how your life might show up for you. Uh, trust that you will receive the things that are meant for you and that you will not receive the things that are not meant for you and um, have gratitude of course for all of it <laughs> so i just want to give you some encouragement if you're an artist who's watching this video if you're wanting to go to graduate school know that it's going to happen when it's meant to happen keep working keep practicing keep taking risks keep growing keep dreaming keep that dream alive again as i said at the beginning of this video it took me a long time to get into an mfa program i had almost a full career <laughs> as a therapist before i went into the program and yeah so just trust that it'll happen when it's meant to and it's okay to feel disappointment and it's okay to feel hope and it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling in the moment um, but again i want to just encourage you to keep dreaming keep believing keep that hope alive in your practice keep creating space for your work i'm actually hoping to create some new videos about art practice i have a playlist that is tips and tricks for art, arts and with or for artists and witches i don't even know my own playlist name <laughs> but i do have a bunch of playlists um, if you're interested and i'm going to be uh, making some videos tips and tricks for applications tips and tricks for art practice let me know if you have some things that you have questions around i do sometimes open up my schedule to connect with people one-on-one -on -one to talk about art practice and about being a practicing artist or about um, business or <laughs> project ideas or ventures i definitely do some consultation work on the side and so sign up for my newsletter i do um, let people know when i have space in my schedule for that it is pretty sporadic <laughs> because i'm pretty busy with a lot of stuff so just get on that newsletter um, i also send out information about upcoming workshops and projects and exhibitions and i also do offer tarot readings that i do around every other month and i release um, my tarot readings there on my newsletter as well so it's kind of a catch-all for everything i do and of course i'm on social media you can see all those social media links on my link tree which again as i said is the first link here in the description if it's your first time here on my channel i really want to invite you to subscribe i am a multidisciplinary multi-dimensional person who has all sorts of videos i make art videos i make videos about art practice and witchcraft and magic i'm also vegan so i do make some vegan recipes i'm always thinking of new things to make <laughs> and do i'm a gemini 
I am very expansive and do not like to limit myself in my visions and dreams. And so there's a lot here. <laughs> Thank you for watching this video, everyone. I hope this is supportive for you. Uh, I hope this has answered some questions. I've gotten so many questions about UC Berkeley and I've gotten a lot of requests for a video like this. So I thought I would make it for all of you. Sending so much love, everyone. Bye.